Hi guys. So today we're going to talk about more out of this book. Okay. And we're going to touch basis on where does disassociation stand? And that is with the A and P and EP issues. We're going to talk about some symptoms, um, the research, which I am also kind of a part of, um, the modification theory and the Basque model and last EMDR. So first we're going to talk about the domain of disassociation. And like I said, this is book is long, so I'm only going to give you bits and pieces that I find will be informative to you. If you decide you want to get the book, you're more than welcome to. It states here, there is a confusion in the literature about which symptoms are dissociative. And there's a list of doctors here that are discussing this. EI absorption, daydreaming, imaginative involvement, ETC should be distinguished from trauma-related structural disassociation. Even though these two categories of symptoms generally occur together, they have different underlining processes. Okay. We have proposed a distinction between structural disassociation and alterations in consciousness because these two categories of phenomena appear to have different underlining mechanisms. In structural disassociation, different parts of the personality do not completely share the same episodic and somatic memories. Alterations in consciousness may involve a failure to create episodic and somatic memories in any part of the personality. Thus, many individuals who experience alterations in consciousness do not have structural disassociation. But all individuals who have developed structural disassociation also have alterations in consciousness. Both ANPs and EPs exhibit alterations in consciousness that can range from mild to extremely pathological at different moments. So what they're saying here is, um, and what I'm getting at here is structural disassociation, I do believe from what I'm reading, is more like a DID issue. Um, an OSDD and, and somewhat BPD issue. But again, this is what I'm getting from this. But they're basically trying to have a meeting, trying to figure out, okay, how do we separate um, symptoms that relate so closely? Like DID, OSDD, and BPD, they all kind of have the same issue, even schizophrenia. But how do you assess and tell the difference? So next I'm gonna give you a short version of this one chapter where it talks about symptoms of structural disassociation, which relates to DID. And it states here, theory clearly discerns dissociative symptoms from non-dissociative ones, but it is often quite difficult to do so in practice. So they're talking about the difficulty of assessing things. There are numerous symptoms which are not considered to be dissociative that we claim are often dissociative. For example, trauma-related symptoms of general psychopathology, e.g. suicidal substance, suicidality, substance use, self-harm, and per promiscuity, may be dissociative whenever they are manifestations of a particular dissociative part of the personality. Now here, there's the, the doctors are talking again and trying to go through things. A symptom can be said to be dissociative only if A there is a clear evidence of dissociative parts of the personality. And B, the symptom is found in one or some parts of the personality, but not in others. This definition implies that responses to self-report questionnaires should not be used as a sole indication of structural disassociation. So they're saying, you know, more assessments, more checking things out because, you know, we wanna make sure that we separate you know, like these disorders from other disorders. Structural disassociation cannot adequately be diagnosed in the absence of careful clinical questioning and observation. This same diagnostic process is needed to determine whether apparently dissociative symptoms are due to one, structural disassociation, or two, non-dissociative alterations in consciousness. Okay. And here they go on to talk about the negative psychoform and the negative sim sim somatoform dissociative symptoms. But I'm going to keep going so we can go down farther. Here they talk about positive psychoform dissociative symptoms. Positive psychoform dissociative symptoms are intrusive symptoms. 
They occur in all post-traumatic disorders. They reflect the intrusion, intrusions of EPs into ANPs and full alteration alternations among ANPs and EPs. Now, if you remember on the prior video, I talk about ANPs and EPs. ANPs are um, a normal. Uh, <sighs> A, a normal part and EPs are emotional parts. Sorry, I have issues blanking out sometimes. EI switching. Mental intrusions of one dissociative part onto another part are often interpreted as Schneiderin's first rank symptoms, FRS of schizophrenia. Those, the voices urging, voices commenting through insertion thought, withdrawal, and so on that occur in dissociative patients should be distinguished from FRS that occur in psychotic patients. So they're talking about, we need to separate these assessments to figure out what's going on here, okay? Now, positive somatoform dissociative symptoms, it states, positive somatoform dissociative symptoms are the behaviors and physical experiences of specific dissociative parts of a personality. They occur in some parts, but not in others. Okay. These symptoms include pain without organic cause, non volatilational behavior, repetitive, uncontrollable movements, um, and sensory perceptions, EI, vision, physical sensations, hearing, taste, and smell that may or may not be distorted. Some positive somatoform symptoms have been described as a FRS, influences playing on the body. So what they're getting at here, and I can use my own example for this, is there are times when the body does not want to do certain things in a dissociative state. And the reason I bring this up and I'm bringing the detail of this through this book is because TikToks made on TikTok, if you notice, they're very, these people that display so-called dissociative symptoms, they will show very valid awareness of what they're doing when they're doing it. But with disassociation, hence dissociative identity disorder, you're in a dissociative state. You may function and do things, but it's not going to be in that much awareness. Um, there are times where I'm unable to move. I am unable to function. I'm unable to do pretty much anything. There's times where I have wet myself. I've had accidents. I've had where I push my chair into the back of the wall and I put holes in the back of my, my therapist office because I'm in another state. I'm not myself. There's no way I could make a TikTok. Now, next, we're going to get into the favorite part that I enjoy, and that's the research um, in support of structural disassociation. And this is huge to me. The theory of structural disassociation of the personality predicts psychobiological differences between the dissociative parts of the personality, i.e. A and P and EP, primarily prime preliminary research supports this prediction. And again, they mention all the doctors in here. The psycho, psychosychological reactions of ANPs and EPs and DID patients were assessed using audio tape descriptions of traumatic memories that only EPs experienced as personal and of shared neutral autobiographical memories. Okay, EPs were responders to trauma memory scripts. Now remember, that's an emotional part. EPs demonstrate significant changes in heart rate, heart rate variability, systolic blood pressure, and had a wide range of sensor, sensor motor and affective reactions. ANPs were basically non-responders, so they're like a freeze response. Neither AMPs nor EPs displayed significant psychopsychological differences in response to scripts of shared neutral autobiographical memories. In the same experiment, patterns of neural activity were studied using a PET. And the doctors are listed here again. There were no differences in regional cerebral blood flow for ANPs and EPs when patients listened to the shared neutral autobiographical memories. On the other hand, ANPs and EPs showed large differences in R RCBF when they listened to the trauma memory skip scripts that were regarded in personal memories by EPs, but not for ANPs. 
These findings, and they mention the doctors again, demonstrate that AMP and EP engage different neural networks when exposed to reminders of traumatizing events. Much empirical work remains to be done about this. Future studies need to be established whether the different types of dissociative parts of the personality have the same underlining process and structure in all post-traumatic disorders. The distinction between A and P and EP will continue to serve a heuristic function in the study of trauma-related mental disorders. Now, the reason I love this is because when you have somebody to help with the testing, your therapist or your psychologist or your doctor will notice these changes. That's why I'm so adamant on pushing this issue that, okay, when you disassociate or you switch from a trigger or flashback and you have an emotional part that's dealing with that, my blood pressure changes. My heart rate changes. I've had thyroid issues change. I've had my body temperature change. And this is all monitored through my therapist. This is all monitored through my physician. So these are things that show real disassociative issues here, real DID. And when I talk about this in vivid detail and people say, well, you're fake claiming, you're doing this. No, I'm not fake claiming. I'm fake claiming the videos themselves because they're inaccurate. They're giving misinformation. And this kind of stuff does not. These are doctors that are working at this to show a point and prove a point that, okay, we are doing the work. Are you guys? <laughs> the other thing I found interesting is in this book, there are 20 pages of the doctors doing this study. 20 pages, guys of every doctor going into this. That's the interesting part. They're doing the research, they're working hard and I give them full credit and I thank them uh, to be a part of this research, to be able to give my, you know, putting myself on the line, going through my memories so that way my studies and what I do are being used to help validate people that really do have this disorder and to invalidate the issues of imitative DID. So next we're going to get into what are they going to do and what are they trying to change. And here in this book it talks about all these doctors, um, the proposed modification of the theory of structural disassociation. So they're trying to update things. They're they're trying to work to get maybe that DSM-6 changed a little more um, in description to separate how these issues occur with like DID, OSDD, BPD, etc. It is a requirement of theory as originally formulated that the dissociative psychological structure, the part self or identity state, must have a subjective sense of selfhood and self-awareness. If this requirement is dropped, however, the model can then be expanded to unify and account for the extensively comorbidity characteristic of dissociative identity disorder and dissociative disorder not otherwise specified. And this is through, again, a bunch of doctors mentioned. Now we're going to skip ahead a little bit. The expanded theory accounts for the comorbidity of DID and DDNOS within a unified theory as well as the full range of dissociative symptoms seen in both disorders. The common comorbid conditions in DID are consistent with the modified structural theory. For example, obsessive compulsive disorder, OSDD, and the impulse control disorders involve the intrusion of magical thoughts, compulsions, and impulses that are ego alien, resisted by the executive self and anxiety provoking. The symptoms, ego alien intrusions, could not occur if the intruding material was held in an integrated executive self. They would then be ego satanic Synth syntotonic thoughts and impulses and could not intrude in an ego alien fashion. They would be experienced as arising from the self. This is true no matter what the content of the intrusions and no matter what the etiology of the structural disassociation. So here it goes on about the, the uh, somatization disorder symptoms can be grouped into intrusions and withdrawals. The intrusions include pain and discomfort symptoms, while the withdrawal symptoms include amnesia, anesthesia, paralysis, blindness, deafness, aphonia, muscle weakness, and trouble walking. The symptomization disorder, the intruding con content, is the sensation component of the Basque model. 
while the withdrawal symptoms span behavior effect, la belle indifference, sensation, and knowledge. Auditory hallucinations and other Schneiderian first-rank symptoms are more common in DID than schizophrenia. In both disorders, most of the first-rank symptoms are intrusions, thought insertion, made thoughts, feelings, and actions, passive influences, voices through out thoughts out loud, thinking someone else's thoughts, or withdrawal symptoms, thought withdrawal. These symptoms could not occur, excuse me, without structural disassociation. <clears throat> now, what they're getting at here is they're saying, okay, we got to make sure we have a, a model or something to assess the differences between here. And I can relate to this because it is put in my paperwork about these such issues, trouble walking. When I come from a long dissociative state or an alternative state, I can't walk sometimes. I can't move. Um, I have muscle weakness. I have where my butt cheeks will literally hurt from shaking for hours because my mind thinks I'm in the past or I'm in a traumatic memory. Um, and I'm, I'm talking blindness. I get hearing loss. I get um, where I can't taste or smell or move or eat or anything. And to let alone make a TikTok would be quite difficult. Okay. Now here it talks about the borderline side of things. The symptoms of borderline personality disorder are also consistent with this model. So they're saying that there's similar symptoms in BPD. The impulsity is an intrusion. Instability of effect is due to cycling intrusions and withdrawals. Identity disturbance is due to fragmentation of the executive self and self-destructive behaviors or secondary efforts to reinforce numbing. Frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment and chronic feelings of boredom and emptiness are either due to massive withdrawal of the effect, identity, meaning, and purpose, or are a secondary behavior reaction to the emptiness described by many people who meet criteria for BPD. So if you go in the DSM-5, these are separate categories um, for a dissociative disorder, okay? And I want to point that out. You, you may show signs like BPD with DID, but the diagnostic has to go from one or to the other. Don't get me wrong, the psychotherapy is the same. But again, there are specific needs that have to be met for both disorders. So you can't really have both. It's either one or the other. The symptoms can be treated the same, but again, there has to be a difference. So last for this is we're gonna get into the Basque model and structural disassociation and a little bit about EMDR and structural disassociation. Now, keep in mind, EMDR and structural disassociation kind of go hand in hand with DID, but they want to bring more awareness about the, the treatment, and this is what this is about, okay? I would like the theory of structural disassociation to be modified to be consistent with the Basque model, which is B-A-S-K. As formulated, the Basque model is straightforward, clinical-friendly, practical, and unencumbered by excessive theorizing. The basic idea is that any element of psychological function can be disassociated and stored elsewhere than in the executive self. This can result in negative or withdrawal symptoms such as amnesia, conversion motor paralysis and anesthesia, and psychic numbing. When the dissociated material intrudes back into the executive self, it often does so in the jarring, sudden way that is experienced as involuntary and ego dystonic. Yeah. Such symptoms can include flashbacks, obsessions, and compulsions, affective instability, impulsive sudden anger, and myriad of other symptoms for, from across the DSM. Now, it states here, the two main points in the present book are, one, the theory of structural disassociation should be modified okay, to include dissociative psychotic content that is stored outside the executive self the ANP, but without an EP being present, and two. This modifi modified version of the theory integrates together a wide range of symptoms and comorbid disorders into a single structure and process, thus allowing for an integrative treatment plan. So what they're saying here is, uh, with the help of Ross, they're, they're working together and they're trying to figure out, okay, we need to update this. We need to get this more specified to meet needs, you know, more personal needs to one's, pa you know, one's patient. Um, basically giving them a structured psychotherapy based around their needs and whatnot.
Now here it gets into the EMDR and structural disassociation. I plan to write about EMDR and disassociation at length elsewhere. This is Ross. Here I want to make only a couple of points. Based on completing the basic, basic training in EMDR, reading a number of books, conversing with Francine Shaparo, and speaking at two EMDR IA conferences, I believe that EMDR is based on a trauma disassociation model. Although altered personalities and dissociative identity disorder are not discussed at length in Shapiro's Texas, and this mentions all the doctors, again, involved in this, EMDR can certainly be used in cases of structural disassociation with various modifications and precautions. According to experienced expert clinicians I have spoken with, there is an emerging literature on the use of EMDR in complex dissociative disorders. And I'm actually kind of a part of that. Um, I've had EMDR in my therapy for, I don't know, eight, nine years now. And the idea is if, if, if you have learned how to do EMDR as a therapist, a therapist can take special classes to meet the needs of your alters. So per se, like when alter 12, before I integrated, she had issues with blindness, um, freezing responses. So my therapist had to modify the EMDR because she couldn't follow the light. She ended up doing it through hearing or through vibrations in the hand. They make these bars to adjust to the needs of an alternative state. But <clears throat> she also uses CBT and DBT um, and EFT with the efforts of the bar. So they actually kind of have different ideas on how to use um, these kind of psychotherapies. Now I'll continue on here. I would like to see collaboration and cooperation between EMDR practitioners and the dissociative disorders field at the clinic clinical and research levels, and also organizationally, and then he mentions the places you can get this, and I want to mention it as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's www.emdria.org and www.isst-d.org. I think there could be benefits in both directions, and he's exactly right on that. EMDR therapists can be sensitized to the fact that they are likely already treating complex dissociative disorders and running into trouble with them at times, and the dissociative disorders field could learn a useful evidence-based treatment model. So he's saying, we'll help you. We'll give you um, lists of where you can go and how you can learn these these." Um, coping coping mechanisms to help a patient okay if i am correct that emdr is fundamentally and systematically a trauma disassociation treatment method um however then the dissociative disorders field could borrow emdr treatment outcome literature as evidence of the treatment fidelity of the dissociative disorders this would be a very good thing he says for this to happen, however, the theory of structural disassociation must be modified in a manner I am proposing. Since the EMDR treatment outcome literature is not based on treatment of structural disassociation, as defined by Van Der Art, Narrows, and Steely, EMDR addresses disassociation in the broad sense and is, in my opinion, fully consistent with the theories of Perry Janet, which are the foundation for dis structural disassociation. And again, structural disassociation, connection with DID, hence they kind of go together. It is also true that the EMDR field could benefit from treatment outcome studies of EMDR for complex dissociative disorders in which there are one or more ANPs and EPs. It's a two-way street with traffic impeded or blocked by more restrictive version of structural disassociation. And again, he's got a, a page, a list of doctors um, going through this. And I'm gonna leave this kind of off with this because I, I have to go, I got about this much left to go through yet. But I wanted to point out, you know, that this is huge. This is huge research that I'm a part of and I'm so proud to be part of. I've been working at this nine years and I'm looking forward to, like I said, um, connecting and working with DVR yet to see if I can maybe go further with this kind of education. I think it is vital to help people that really do have DID and to get rid of the misinformation that's out there. So. So I hope you found this video useful. You're more than welcome to definitely use this one in your therapy and for home personal use, vice versa. So that's all I have today, guys. Loves. Bye.